we at the Public Lectures Committee, we are very proud of the selected speakers that we have. And we have two types of speakers. We have the distinguished scientists that tell you about the leading edge research that they're doing here. And we have the future distinguished scientists who tell us about the leading edge research that are just starting. And this, the latter case is what is happening today. Uh, James Cryan uh, got his undergraduate degree from the Ohio State University. And he came to Stanford to work with uh, Professor Philip Buxbaum, who is the director of the Pulse Institute. It's the Pulse Institute for Ultra-Fast Energy Science. And what I think is going to happen tonight is that he and his colleagues will actually will be known in the future as pioneers of ultra-fast X-ray science with LCLS. And you're just witnessing science in the making here. It's history in the making. So you're privileged. Um, before I give the floor to James, uh, there is one date that I want you to write down, which is March 23. Why is that? What is happening on March 23rd? Anyone has an idea? Yeah, there might be another lecture. Very good. I just lost my job. But the truth is, we don't have the title yet. So the poor speaker is going to have only two months to prepare. But it's going to be good, as usually is. So check on our website and come back again. So I talk too much. Let's give the floor to James, and let's welcome him with very warm applause. Thank you. Is this, can you, can everybody hear me? OK. All right. <laughs> Speak up. OK, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm here to uh, present to you a lecture um, entitled Molecules in the Spotlight. And it's all about uh, an experiment we ran at the LCLS. So to start off, I'll start where any good lecture should with the speaker. So this is me right here in the lab. I'm an atomic physicist, a uh, card-carrying atomic physicist. So what does that mean? Well, that means I'm concerned about atoms and also molecules. Molecules are just uh, a couple of atoms bound together. So what can we do with atoms and molecules? Well, we can put them together to make everything. Well, almost everything. I'm sure you guys can think of something See, everybody in this room can probably think of something that is included in everything and it isn't made out of atoms and molecules. But the vast majority of stuff is made out of atoms and molecules. This includes ducks, both rubber and real. And it includes planets, both real and models. And it also includes cars. So we could sit down and we could describe what every atom and molecule inside a car is doing. But there's actually an unimaginable number of atoms and molecules inside a car. So describing what every one of them is doing is not really the best plan. And it uh, will take a lot of time, and it will be very hard to do. So that's why we invented engineers. This is my little engineer here. <laughs> and engineers are very smart people who have lots of books and tables, and they have a lot of knowledge about how things work together, how large groups of atoms behave. So a car is not what we want to study by atoms and molecules. So what would we like to study that's part of everything? Well, for instance, we could study solar cells. Um, solar cells actually work on a molecule-by-molecule -molecule basis. We're interested with how light will interact with different atoms to convert into electrical energy, or to even store energy. This that whole idea is called energy science. And engineers work on energy science, too. They use all of their, their know-how about how the physical world works, and their books, and their tables, <laughs> right here depicted. <laughs> our, here's our little engineer. And they can study how solar cells work, and they can try to make them more efficient. We approach it from another perspective, right? We're trying to rewrite the rules of how things are working. We're trying to look for new materials that might be important to uh, make solar cells. So not, we're not trying to build a better silicon. We're trying to go a completely different direction. So for instance, we could look at organic materials. And here when I say organic, I don't mean grown without chemicals, like at the grocery store, you go and you buy organic fruit because it's not doesn't have preservatives. No, here organic means it's made out of carbon. The main thing is carbon. And these organic materials are capable of converting optical or light energy into electronic energy. It happens all around us, right? For example, 
plants every day create energy through a process called photosynthesis, which relies on this molecule right here, chlorophyll. So remember I showed you that little dumbbell earlier and told you that this is a molecule and this is what I'm interested in. Well, that little dumbbell is just like one little bar here. So if you look at this chlorophyll, it's really complicated. I mean, it has lots, each of these little um, vertices right here is a carbon atom. So this is made up of a bunch of carbon atoms plus some other atoms, and it's very complicated. The structure itself is very complicated. And so understanding site by site what happens when light is shined on this molecule is very difficult. And it's, it's been impossible to do. So we have no idea right now, well, we have some basic ideas, but no real idea of what happens immediately after light is shined on chlorophyll. We just know that somehow electrical energy comes out. So how can we better study this? Well. This is why we're all here, the LCLS. So I'm going to really quickly talk about what is the LCLS and why is it so special. So here you can see the LCLS right here. Here's 280. Most of you probably took this to get here, possibly. So you see the linear accelerator is really long. And we're right around in here. This is a Slack campus. So what is the LCLS? It's the world's first x-ray free electron laser, which if you were here last two months ago, probably you heard about this from uh, Daniel Ratner, and he told you all about how this amazing machine works. So we'll talk about it really quickly. It starts with the already existing Slack accelerator right here that, that um, accelerates a bunch of electrons. Now these electrons go through the accelerator and pass into right here where they are, we have a bunch of magnets. We call these magnets undulators. And what they do is they make these electrons wiggle. When these electrons wiggle, they give off x-rays, lots and lots of x-rays. So that's one reason the LCLS is so special gives off trillions and trillions of photons. It's the McDonald's of photons. <laughs> and besides this, it's like McDonald's in another way, too. It's really, really fast. <laughs> so all of these photons are delivered in about three and a half femtoseconds, for, for our experiment at least, which is an incredibly short time. So most of you might not be familiar with a femtosecond. How short is it? Well, we'll use a quick analogy. A femtosecond is to a second as one second is to the age of the universe. So I'd say that's like a blink of an eye, but it's so much shorter than a blink of an eye. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to even think about how, how short this actually is. So now we have this tool, but how will we use this to, to describe molecules? Well, we'll do a molecular magic trick. So you guys are all probably familiar with the magic trick I'm about to describe. You see the magician walk up to a table with a bunch of place settings, glasses, and, and plates on it. And then he really quickly pulls the, pulls the tablecloth out from under and leaves everything just sitting there. So that's the trick. But how, is, how are we going to make this science? Well, then we'll hold up the tablecloth, and we'll look at the imprints of what was on the tablecloth to see where everything was. So this is a kind of trick that we're going to try to do with molecules. And right, like this magic trick, if you're ever trying to learn to do it, which I tried to for this lecture, and it didn't work so well. <laughs> that's why I used the graphic. <laughs> You don't start with an entire place setting, right? You start with something simple. So you'll put one glass or one plate on the, on the table, and you'll try to pull the cloth out from under just one thing instead of a whole bunch. So for ours, we tried nitrogen gas. And there's other we reasons we'll use nitrogen that we'll talk about in a minute. But we just used a simple nitrogen gas, which is just two nitrogen atoms bound together. So now to further explain what I mean with this analogy to a magic trick, we need to understand something about atomic structure. So let's do a quick review. You guys probably have all seen this, the periodic table, uh, maybe in chemistry class. Now I know you're thinking, man, we came to a physics lecture. What's he doing talking about chemistry? <laughs> but it's all the same. So what's important on the periodic table? Well, let's start with hydrogen, the physicist's best friend. And it's the physicist's best friend because it's so simple. It's atomic number one. So if you remember what an atomic number is, Great. If you don't, I'll explain it in a second. But it's atomic number one, so it's the simplest atom that you can have. So what other, what other atoms are important for us right now? Well, we'll probably talk about carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And these are all very important in biology and in organic materials. So these are the, the main players that we're going to talk about tonight. OK, so let's jump right into it. Let's talk about atomic structure. So you guys all may remember that atoms are actually made up of smaller pieces. They're made up of a nuclei and they're made up of electrons. The nuclei is actually made up of smaller pieces, the proton and the neutron. But for the purpose of this lecture, we're just going to talk about the nuclei as one part. 
So as I said, the atomic number, the atomic number describes the number of protons that are in the nucleus. Also, we know that atoms are neutral things. They don't have a charge. Well, protons are positively charged, right? We all probably remember that. And electrons are nuclear, or are negatively charged. And remember, opposite charges attract and like charges repel, right? Do we all probably remember that? At some point, we've learned that or played with magnets or seen something like this. So we, we know that atoms are neutrally charged. So if we have some number of protons, we have to have the same number of electrons. OK, so now we can start to talk about models of how an atom works. And the first model we're going to talk about is the planetary model developed by Ernest Rutherford after a series of experiments in 1909. And here's Ernest Rutherford right here. And here's his model. In his model, the nucleus is the positive charge, sits at the center, and the electrons orbit around it, kind of like planets around the sun, which gives us the name, the planetary model. However, this model has problems. Electrons aren't planets. They have charges. So weird things happen because they're charged. So actually, this model of the atom is unstable, and these atoms would decay in less than a second. So this is wrong. So the, this model doesn't work. So what do you do when your model's broke? You call a quantum mechanic. <laughs> so this brings us to quantum mechanics, which is the, the theory that comes after, after uh, we talk about the planetary model. And here are some of the major players that were responsible for quantum mechanics. There's many more, but these four were exceptionally important. Heisenberg, Schrodinger, Einstein, and Bohr all had very important roles to play in quantum mechanics. The main idea behind quantum mechanics is that electrons are like waves. And as a result, this means that atoms are quantized. Now, quantization, this is a difficult concept. So what do I mean when I say quantized? Well, let's think about it in terms of a hill. So here we have just a normal hill with a ball on top of it. The ball will roll down the hill. And the ball, can, can, as it's rolling down the hill, can be at any height that it wants to be. So we call this a classical hill. Now, what if we quantized this hill or made it quantum mechanical? Well, now, the ball can no longer be anywhere. It has to be at a certain height. So it can either be at this height or this height or this height, but it can't be anywhere between. So, so far, we see that quantum mechanics is a very black and white subject. Something is either black or it's white. There's no shades of gray here. But the ball can still roll down the hill, we see. It just doesn't take, it just only sits at certain heights. So what does this mean when we compare it to atoms? Well, now atoms, from quantum mechanics, we said they were quantized. What we mean is the energies of the electrons are actually quantized. So they have discrete values. So the energy of an electron can either be here or here, or here, but it can't be anywhere between. It has to sit in one of these levels. The other important thing about these levels, we learned from quantum mechanics, is they're like two-bedroom apartments. So two electrons can live in each, in each apartment, and like any good apartment building, they fill from the bottom up. Because who wants to walk up the stairs if you don't have to? And so I, I, these electrons are just lazy. So also associated with each of these uh, energy levels is, an, uh, is what we call an orbital which is very close to the word orbit right? that I used before, but it's not an orbit. right? These things don't go around the nucleus. They kind of sit there, and they're like waves, and they sit there in a cloud. So we call these clouds orbitals. So what do these orbitals look like? Well, we can start with this very ground state, or the, very, the lowest energy state. And this has a name. We call it the 1s. And you can see a picture of it here. You have the nucleus sitting at the center and a cloud of electrons around it. And this electron cloud looks like a sphere. It's just a ball. So now we move slightly up in energy. And we see, OK, now we just have a slightly bigger ball. We still have this electron cloud. And these electrons can sit anywhere around here. And we just have a bigger ball. Now we get a little weird. We move to a slightly higher energy. And all of a sudden, now we see something called a 2p. Now maybe you guys have seen this before a long time ago in a chemistry class or physics somewhere. But this 2p orbital right, has two lobes. So we have, see a lobe here and a lobe here. And they're colored two different colors just so you can tell, just so you can differentiate. There are two spots the electrons can be. It can be either on the top or the bottom. Likewise, we could orient this in any way. So we could put a lobe here and a lobe here, or a lobe coming out at you or in the lobe behind the, the page. So we see there's actually three of these p, three ways to make these p levels. So now we've talked a little bit about shape. And these shapes are what, what give shape to the world around us. And so now we know basically everything we need to know about atomic structure to move on. So what can we do with this? What can, we, what can we do now that we can describe atoms? Well, we can start to describe something more complicated, molecules. And how do we make a molecule? Well, like I said, molecules are just atoms that are put together. So we could take two atoms, and we could put them close to each other. 
Now when they're close to each other, remember these electrons are in this orbit or in these orbitals somewhere just bouncing around. Um, so what do they do? Well, they feel each other's effects. And actually these clouds start to combine. So they come together and they start to combine. And you can combine them in two ways, and two very mathematical ways. You could either add them and you would get a shape that looks like that, or you could bring your two atoms together and their clouds could subtract and you get another shape like that. Again, the, the red and the blue just mean that there are two places this could be. So what can we say about these two different shapes? Well, remember I said the nuclei have protons in them that are positively charged and that like charges repel each other. So these nuclei don't want to be close together. They want to pull the atoms apart and be separated. But if we look at this cloud right here, we see that we have some, some uh, electrons in, in between the two, or we have some of the electron cloud in between the two nuclei. Now this effect, now you have positive charges with a negative charge in between. And so these positive charges are actually pulled towards this negative charge. So a cloud like this actually pulls the nuclei together and binds the molecule. And so we call these orbitals, these types of orbitals, bonding orbitals. Now down here you see we have no electron cloud in between, right? There's nothing in here. So now the <coughs> nuclei just see each other and they want to be pulled apart. And these, these or types of orbitals tend to pull molecules apart. So we call these antibonding orbitals. See there, we're pretty good at naming. So let's do an example. Let's talk about how we can use what we know about bonding and antibonding orbitals. So here we have the physicist's best friend, hydrogen. Right? Remember we said a hydrogen atomic number one has one proton. So each hydrogen atom has one electron, and it's sitting here in this 1s, right? Because they fill from the bottom. They, they fill like a two-story apartment. So now we can bring our two hydrogen atoms close together, right? Remember, we get a plus and we get a minus, so we have our two shapes. And now, just like when we filled up the atomic orbitals, we can fill these molecular orbitals right here, and we can do that. And our two electrons hop in, and they're both sitting here in this binding orbital that wants to pull these these molecules together. And they're both really happy. See, they have little smiley faces. They're happy being down there. <laughs> so this explains why all of the hydrogen we see in our atmosphere is actually in the form of H2. And we don't see very much just normal hydrogen floating around. So now we can get slightly more complicated. What's a little bit bigger than hydrogen? Well, helium. Helium is atomic number two. It has two protons, so it has two electrons. And we can see those guys sitting here. We can bring the two heliums together. And we do the, these combinations again. And now we can go ahead and fill these orbitals. And now you see we have two of these uh, electrons sitting down here in this bonding orbital that are happy. And we have two up here that are in these antibonding orbitals. And they are very unhappy. They don't want to be up here. They want to pull the nuclei apart. So this explains why we don't actually see helium-2. You can't go to the store and buy helium-2. It doesn't exist. And this tells us why. Because now we, uh, we see that these two electrons up here don't want to sit there. So what can we do with all of this? Well, now we can just uh, start to describe this experiment this, uh, that I was explaining to you. And we can also start to understand why some things bind together and why some things don't bind together. So I said in our experiment that we use nitrogen. So we should probably understand nitrogen before we move on. So let's start to do that. Now, nitrogen is a little bit more complicated. So maybe we should start with just the nitrogen atom first. So remember, we have these levels, the 1s, the 2s, and the 2p. And we remember what those look like, right? The 1s, a little ball the 2s, a slightly bigger ball, and the 2p has these weird lobes, right? They're not too weird, but it has these lobes. So now what happens when we overlay all these on top of each other, just to get an idea of scale? So we see that the 1s right here, we can see it flashing right there, we call this the core. And we see that these, these orbitals, or the electrons in this orbit, are very close to the nuclei and are very tightly bound and stay very close to the nuclei. Now if we look at the 2s, it's flashing right there. It's, it's a lot more spread out, right? It's not nearly as close to the nucleus. And if we look at the 2p, well, we see that's way far out there. And remember, this 2p is a lot higher in energy. So now we see that the 2p, we call the, the 2p the valence. You know, it's just a name. And we also call the 1s the core, right? Right here, we call this the core. So the core is very close to the nuclei and is very tightly bound. The valence is very spread out, not very tightly bound, and has a large spatial extent. So actually, these valence electrons are the electrons, or these electrons in the valence are the electrons that interact with the outside world. And the core just kind of sits there. It doesn't know anything about its environment. It has no idea what's going on outside. And the valences are the, are the talkers, right? They're the, they're the social people. 
So now we can go ahead and we can do the same idea we just did with hydrogen and helium and try to describe how nitrogen bonds. So now we see it looks a little bit more complicated, right? Nitrogen has seven electrons, so there's, there's a lot of them. Now we can bring our two nitrogen atoms together and we get these energy levels, right? And now we can start to fill our energy levels. So first we'll start with the 1s. They fill, and you see we get a bonding and an antibonding. So now we can fill the, from this 2s. We see we get another bonding and we get another antibonding. So, so far, we don't know if nitrogen wants to be bound or not. So now we can do the p's. And now look, we have three pairs of electrons in these bonding orbitals. So they're very happy. So the nitrogen is the happiest thing we've seen so far. So this explains these three electron pairs explain why nitrogen atoms are very strongly bound. In fact, nitrogen is one of the strongest bind, bound, uh, one of the strongest uh, bonds you'll find in nature. All right. So we showed you what these orbitals look like when we were talking about atoms, but do they look the same for these molecules? Well, let's see. So we can start to look at these these uh, orbitals. So what are the so first? The nuclei are these little black dots, right? We see those. So what do the core orbitals look like, right? These are the ones that are really close to the nucleus. Well, that's these blue, these little blue guys. So you see these core orbitals are very distinct and separated and um, are very close to the nucleus. Whereas the valence, right, remember that term, is this green blob that's spread out. So the valence is spread out over the entire molecule, where the core is isolated around each nuclei in the molecule. And the valence, right, we said, is the part that interacts with the outside world. So what happens when molecules interact? Well, that's what we like to call chemistry. So we just named it. We said molecules interact, and we call that chemistry. And right, we also said that um, the interactions occur mainly through the valence, or the electrons. So actually, chemistry is the study of valence electrons. That's all it is. I mean, if you're a chemist, I'm sorry that I dumbed <laughs> down your profession so much. But really, you're just studying the valence chemistry, or the valence, uh, valence electrons. So how do you actually do that? So now we know that they're there, but how do we actually study them? Well, that's pretty easy. We just take a picture, right? It's very easy. How, how, do, you, how do you study something? You take a picture of it. But can you actually just take a picture? When you think of taking a picture, right, normally you hold up a camera and you click the button and something happens, right? But usually when you're taking a picture, you're, what's actually happening is you're opening some sort of shutter and exposing some kind of film or sensor, and then the shutter closes. So what happens if the, the action you're trying to study is much faster than you can open and close a shutter, which is definitely the case with atoms and molecules, but happens with other things in, in life, daily life around you too. People sprinting is, is faster than a shutter can open and close. Well, we developed something for that called a stroboscopic image. So I know that's a big word, um, but strobe you can think of as like a strobe light. We've all had, we probably all have seen a strobe light and watch them flash and walk in it and everything. You can capture individual things like they're standing still. So this is a stroboscopic image of a cat jumping off a branch. So <clears throat> what we do is we, we use short pulses of light or flashes of light to capture this. So we leave an aperture open or we leave the exposure open and we just flash a light real quick to capture the cat falling. So what's important if we're taking stroboscopic images? Well, the first thing is, we need short light pulses or short flashes, right? If we have a really long flash, well, then the motion of the cat just gets spread out and you don't really see anything. If you use a really short um, flash, well, now you start to resolve what the cat is actually doing and you can see how it falls and how it twists. What else is important? Well, I mean, this is a, should have probably been first, but in order to study the motion, the cat needs to jump off the branch, right? So if just by having the camera there, the cat doesn't want to jump because maybe he's camera shy. Well, that wouldn't be a good way to study it, right? Or, or likewise, if you want to get a picture of you and all of your friends, and you take a picture, and everybody blinks when the flash goes off, well, then you're not going to get a very good picture. This is the same idea with molecules, right? If, uh, if we want to study molecules, and the probe or the light flash that we're trying to use ruins the molecule, then it isn't a very good way to study it, right? I mean, I think that, would, that sounds like pretty common sense. So now, remember what the whole idea we wanted to study, right, with molecules, was we wanted to study interactions of molecules on the level of what's going on at each individual site. Remember we showed chlorophyll and we said what's going on at each part? That's what we want to study. So we want to know what's going on with each part of the cat in analogy, right? So we can do that by studying the core of the cat, the core, right? If we study the core um, 
orbitals of a molecule, we see what each nuclei is doing because they're right around the nuclei. Whereas if we study the valence, you can see everything gets kind of smeared out. So I don't know if you caught that. We'll do it again. So the core, right, you can see each little part of the cat and how it's twisting and turning and what it's doing to actually write itself. And if we studied the valence of the cat, which isn't quite right, we see that it's smeared out, right? And we can't really tell what's going on with each part of the cat. We can see that it's falling, but we don't really know what's going on inside. So how do we actually take these pictures? Well, we use light. So what do we know about light? You guys have maybe heard this before, that light behaves like a wave and a particle, or a warticle. <laughs> and if Dr. Seuss were a physicist who discovered this, it would just be called a warticle. But it wasn't Dr. Seuss. Einstein actually did a lot of work with this. And he, uh, I, and the particle aspect of light, which is what we'll focus on, has been called a photon. And actually, Einstein did work with this, and he won the Nobel Prize for his famous equation that E equals, that's really close, but it's actually HF. <laughs> but you guys almost had it, right? So E here is the energy of a photon. F is the frequency of the light. And H is a constant named after Max Planck, who actually was a hero of Einstein. So one of the few scientists that Einstein actually looked up to. So we've probably all seen a picture of this before, the electromagnetic spectrum, probably when you come to these talks. But we see right here we have, so this, but normally we talk about this in terms of wavelength or, or frequency. Now we're going to talk about energy, right? Because energy and frequency from that equation are pretty similar, right? So we see visible light right here. And we're all familiar with visible light. Blue light up here has the highest frequency, or is the highest energy photon. And red light is the lowest energy photon and lowest frequency. So lower in energy than, than visible light are microwaves, right? which we're all probably familiar with. We cook our food with them. And these are how our cell phones work, or with microwaves. Now if we go slightly higher in energy, we see the UV. Now the UV stands for ultraviolet, is very important. It, does, um, it interacts with molecules quite well, and molecules like, to, absor like to, to react with UV light. And if we go even higher in energy, we see x-rays. And this is where the LCLS works, is way down in the x-ray, so way above the UV. So we'll talk about that in a second. Right here? Since I don't know. It says it's censored, right? <laughs> Under the Patriot Act, I don't know what that's about. <laughs> so we should also mention that, uh, <laughs> OK, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about how light interacts with matter, right? And we would say that a photon is absorbed if the energy of that photon matches the difference between these atomic energy levels, right? So remember, these energy levels right, of an atom are quantized, right? So it can only take a certain value. It can't be in between. So now, here's an example of absorption. We have a hydrogen atom, right? It has a, a 1s energy, and it has a 2p energy. And now if a photon comes through, if it's at the right energy, it can excite this electron. Likewise, we can talk about something called the photoelectric effect. Uh, or you might know it as ionization. Or to better explain it, free electrons or are, are created if the, electro if the energy of the photon is greater than the energy that binds the electron to the material. So the photoelectric effect was actually uh, first coined by Einstein in 1905, which contrary to popular belief, he actually won the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect and not for relativity. Um, he actually, relativity was too controversial at the time to, for him to win the Nobel Prize. So they gave him the Nobel Prize for photoelectric effect because he just did too many amazing things. And they just gave it to him for one of them. So in here, we have photons that hit a material, and then they excite these electrons and free them. So really quick, before we move on, I'd like to remind you real quick about nitrogen. Remember, we have nitrogen atoms that come together to make these molecular orbitals or molecular energy levels, and then we fill it with electrons. So we should remember what this structure looks like in here, because we're going to need that. So here, you see these again. These are the nitrogen energy levels. Now, what does this look like? What are these energies? These of these things look like compared to these photons? Well, so here's visible light. And visible light is about 2 eV. Now, what's an eV? An eV is a measure of energy that's very convenient to use when you're talking about photons. <laughs> so this is just a measure of energy. So we see a visible photon is 
is very low energy. It doesn't have enough energy actually to, to remove an electron from nitrogen. Now, to remove a core electron, down here is the core, remember, it takes about 400 EV. That's a lot. That's a, that's a lot more than, a visible, than visible light. This is in the X-ray area. And the X-rays at the LCLS are around 1,000 EV, so they're huge. <laughs> they're, they're really high energy, right? So now we can imagine doing an experiment, right, where we would, we would slowly turn up the photon energy and see what comes out, right, and watch the electrons that come out. So we're going to do that. So right, we see here, here are occupied orbitals of uh, nitrogen, and now we start with a very low photon energy, right? And now this doesn't have enough energy to make an electron, so we don't see anything. Now we turn up the energy a little bit more, and all of a sudden, we have enough energy to free an electron. And so over here, we're going we're gonna to plot our photon energy as we go this way, and the number of electrons that we see created. So here we see a little peak. Now we increase the energy a little bit more, and now, oh, we see another peak, right? Because now we can free this other level. Now we increase the energy just a little bit more, and we see we can free from this level, and now we see three peaks here. Now if we increase the energy a little bit more, we don't quite have enough energy, right? So now we still see the same three peaks, but we don't see anything else. If we increase the energy a little bit more, we can free that level and create a free electron. So we see another peak, and if we keep going, Eventually, we'll get to the core. And when we get to the core, we'll see we can create a lot of electrons out of here. So, and remember that the core was around X-ray wavelengths, whereas all of these upper levels, these valence levels, were UV energies, right? So the UV has an energy between 10 and 100 EV. And these X-rays were a lot bigger, they, a lot higher energy. They were around 400. So what happens when we shine X-rays on our nitrogen? Well, let's see. When, we've put a, when we shine an X-ray photon on our nitrogen, we see that we'll just take one of these core orbitals and we'll free it. Or this is shown schematically over here as a little hole. Right? So we call these, these missing uh, electrons in this core a core hole. Right? And this state is actually very unstable. So let's think about a Jenga tower. And if you take out some of the pieces off of the bottom, it's not very likely to stand up. right? If you just take a couple of pieces out of the bottom, that thing will fall over very quickly. Or at least when I play Jenga, it falls over really quickly. <laughs> the same is true here. And actually, um, these, these, uh, these uh, I guess, configurations of electrons will also decay very quickly. And they decay through a process known as Auger decay. And in Auger decay, you can think of two electrons are just bouncing around in these clouds, and eventually they run into each other. When they run into each other, one of these falls into this hole, this core hole created right here, and another one takes the extra energy and is shot out and is freed from the, from the atom or the, new, or the molecule. So we can see that schematically, and that happens. And this decay is very fast. It happens in about seven femtoseconds, right? So remember we said a femtosecond, so this is like seven seconds to the age of the universe if we were comparing it. So a little background, actually, first on Auger decay. Auger decay was discovered by, or was the credit for Auger decay was given to this guy here, Pierre Auger. He's a French physicist, who, a French atomic physicist who worked with studying cosmic rays when he first observed um, this decay. But actually, three years before, uh, an Austrian physicist, uh, Lisa Meitner, actually first discovered Auger decay. Um, now, it's tragic that she was overlooked in the naming. What's even more tragic is after this, she went on to discover um, nuclear fission, which is what runs all of our nuclear power plants. And she shared this with her colleague, Otto Hahn. And then the Nobel Committee was looking at who to give the Nobel Prize for, to for um, nuclear fission. And she was overlooked, and the award was given to Otto Hahn. So that's, that's just tragic, and I feel bad. So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to try to refer to it as O.J. Meitner decay. So now, remember we had this ionization spectrum, or this, this graph of energies of, uh, of electrons um, when we turned up this photon energy? We could get the same type of thing when we talk about these Auger, Meitner electrons, right? So we can have this decay happen, and then we can collect these electrons, and we'll get a spectrum. So this is our spectrum. This is going this way is the number of electrons we see, and this way is energy. So now you see there's a bunch of little bumps in here. Well, why are there bumps? Well, these bumps could happen because um, 
right? We said this decay happens because two electrons run into each other. Well, any two electrons in here could run into each other. So for instance, this peak right here in red, this happened because these two electrons up here ran into each other, and one filled the hole and the other left. But over here, this, this peak right here actually happened because this electron and this electron ran into each other. So you see, each one of these bumps happens because different pairs of electrons actually ran into each other, and it's not just as easy as I made it sound initially. It's a little bit more complicated. So now we'll do a quick reminder on the LCLS, right? We all remember this. It's the McDonald's of X-ray photons, right? It makes trillions and trillions of them, and it's also really fast. Remember we said these pulses we used were about three and a half femtoseconds. Now, that's actually shorter than the OJ time I told you a minute ago, right? I told you that these things don't decay for about seven femtoseconds. So this is much shorter. So then what happens when the LCLS interacts with a nitrogen molecule? Well, first, it's x-rays, right? So it's going to ionize from the core. So the first x-ray photon comes in and ionizes one from the core. Now before anything else can happen, another photon comes by and ionizes another uh, electron from the core. And this happens before, so we see we have two core holes now, one on each um, atomic, one, uh, one around each nuclei. And this happens before the valence electrons even have a chance to react. So now these valence electrons are, are frozen in place and this core hole happens. So that's interesting. And then also these core holes are even less stable. So think about your Jenga tower and now take away even more parts. Now it's even more likely to fall over, and it falls over in about two femtoseconds. So what can we say about all these things that we've just learned about? Let's summarize all of these things we know about double core holes. So there we see the decay happen. And we know, right, we said the valence electrons are frozen in place when this decay happens. And this decay happens very quickly, and it gives high energy electrons. The other thing, these double cores, this energy of these electrons that come off are very sensitive to separation and bonding between the two atoms. So now we have a tool that we can use to study how these atoms are, are linked together, right? So we've just built our molecular magic trick, right? And so to summarize, to, to complete the analogy, our place setting here is the valence environment or the nuclear separation in these, in these molecules. And our placemat is these double core holes that I've been talking to you about. And finally, looking at the dimples in the mat is like collecting the OJ electron. So by doing all of this, we can do our molecular magic trick, and I can lose my license as a molecular magician, because I just explained it to you. <laughs> so what you should know is that using this technique, we can measure the strength of a bond without disrupting the bond. And we, can, we should be able to watch what happens, watch the readjustment of molecules as it happens. As the nuclei move around, we should be able to watch them um, using this trick. So this is all great, and these double core holes are, are, are an awesome tool. But can you actually make them? Everything I've told you right now, I've just told you, right? I haven't shown you anything that says these happen. Well, this is why we did it in our experiment. Our experiment, the goal, was to detect these double core holes and also to study their angular dependence. So in order to do that, what did we have? Well, we had this big contraption um, where we have a bunch of electron detectors, and we shot the LCLS in this way. The LCLS came in with its photons this way, or if we blow it up, we can see it here. We had the little molecules the x-rays coming at them into the, going into the, the display. And then the electrons will first ionize an electron and then we'll have an OJ electron come <coughs> off. So we'll have the decay. And so we'll, we'll collect all of these electrons with these detectors right here. This will collect the ions that are left over. And here is where we'll put our nitrogen into our experiment. <coughs> so this is just a rendering, right? Some, an engineer drew this and just rendered it. So it's really nice to see. So what did it actually look like? It looked like a mess. So here, right here, we see this is where we did our experiment. This is the uh, AMO hutch at the LCLS. So this is the outside looking in. So our experiment happened inside here. It all has to happen inside a hutch because x-rays are dangerous. They can ionize things, so they could ionize you. <laughs> so they don't want anybody in there and dancing around in the x-rays. I mean, it's not like when you go to the doctor and get an x-ray of a bone. Um, it's probably more dangerous. <laughs> So here you can see this is our whole setup. So the LCLS beam actually comes through this tube right here and comes into our, this is uh, our experimental chamber that I just showed you. So all of those detectors and everything that I showed you that were nicely resolved and you could see what was going on, well, that's this big mess of stuff right here. Here we see from a different angle, the LCLS goes down this, or the, the photons go down this tube, and back here is our, is our uh, experimental chamber. So still, 
kind of messy. So here we can see we have another rendering of what this machine looks like. It still looks complicated. The LCLS beam comes through this way. Here's some of our detectors here and here. And this is our big gas jet that I described. So this is, this is our apparatus also drawn. See, so now you can still see that it's complicated, but you can still kind of see it. And this is the control room, not to control the entire LCLS, but this is the control room just to control this little machine right here. So all of this is dedicated to controlling this machine right here. So it's a pretty big effort. So now, remember, this is this OJ spectrum that we just talked about. Right, so we see that this is, this is the spectrum that we talked about, and we can describe each of these by different um, combinations of these electrons, the different final combinations of these electrons. So I blew it up right here, and we can see our spectrum. And now, let's overlay the spectrum we got from the LCLS. And what do we see? We see an extra bump. So we've done it. We have found this double core hole. For the first time ever, we have seen this. No one ever before us has ever seen this and we see this bump for the first time. So that's really exciting. This was a celebration <laughs> after we finished this. I went to my boss's house and had breakfast and said we did it. <laughs> so why did we do all of this? Well, remember our initial problem. We wanted to study something about chlorophyll, right? We, or we wanted to study energy conversion. So we wanted to understand the interactions of the parts of this molecule with light. So a photon would come in, and what happens? We don't know. We needed a tool. Well, now we have a tool to unravel the mystery of energy conversion in nature without destroying the bonds, right? This is this molecular magic trick, right? We have a tool that now we can, by pulling the cloth out, we can probe each individual bond and see what's going on, right? We can see what's going on in this bond, what's going on in this bond. And we can do it in such a fast manner that we can do it ex right after the photon hits the chlorophyll, and we can uh, probe it. So what's next? Do we just put chlorophyll in the LCLS? Well, you could. Some people, probably, some people do want to do this. They just want to put chlorophyll in there and see what happens. But I think all you're going to be able to study then is still the structure of chlorophyll and not really the function. So what do we want to do? We want to take little smaller parts and put those in the LCLS and try to discover the function of all of that. So for example, we kind of just studied this little bond right here. right? Just this little part is all we put in there, one little, one little uh, line. So what should we do next? Well, let's pick another line. Let's pick this line. Or let's pick this line over here. Or pick your favorite line, right? You can find your favorite line in this diagram, and you can put it in the LCLS, and you can study how it interacts with light. And that's what we'd like to do. We'd like to have a tool that we can come up with a function of each little part here. And even though nature does it so well and has refined this process over billions of years, maybe we can find a way to do it better. Maybe by knowing the function of each little part, we can say, oh, well, we don't actually need this down here, or we don't need this, and we can find a better way to do this. And we'll have a better way to change uh, light energy into electrical energy, or even the other way, to turn electrical energy back into lights and make better lighting for rooms, or, or to come up with better ways to solve our energy problems. So thank you very much for listening. Um, as I said, these LCLS, the LCLS is a big machine. We have a huge number of people that were involved in just helping us do our experiment. All of these people were actually just involved to help us do our experiment. So it was a big, it was a big group of people. It was very helpful. And I'd also like to thank the US Department of Energy Offices of Science for uh, giving me funding. So thank you very much. Well, that was a fun lecture, very entertaining. I'm sure there are a bunch of questions in the audience. So we're going to entertain questions for a while. I'm going to ask James to repeat the question when it's asked to the benefit of the people in the back. Okay. okay? And I'm going to do this. I'm going to be looking at the three different parts. So if I don't pick you now, I'm going to pick you in a minute. So, okay, let's start here in the middle, right down here. Oh, well. Repeat the question. Repeat the well, question. How much did it cost to do this experiment? Well, the, <laughs> yeah, the LCLS uh, is a user facility. So actually, for me, to, uh, to my research group, it, it didn't cost us really anything other than to pay me yeah. to be there, to be there all night to, to sit there and watch this machine. But I think uh, the last figure I heard was that the, the LCLS costs somewhere around a dollar a second to operate. 
something, something like that when it's turned on. So something close to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We have we have another question over there. How does it create, so the question was, how does it create the stable and unstable bonds? Uh, so I think you're talking about these two orbitals where we came together and we made a plus and a minus, yeah. right? So we came, so I mean, if we just try to conserve number of, uh, of orbitals, we came in with two orbitals, right? We had these two spheres, and they came together, and now you made two combinations. You made a plus combination, you made a minus combination, right? So if we just conserve numbers, if if two orbitals go in, then you have to get two orbitals out. And these two orbitals have to have different energies, and they also have to have a different shape, right? They can't, they can't have the same shape. Um, so in, in having a different shape, this one looked just like a, an elliptical blob, and the other one, because it had to have a different shape, had two blobs that weren't connected in the middle. So, um, and right because of this, this blob that's connected in the middle pulls everything together, uh, it makes everything stable, and this, this other blob, um, these, there's two of them, and there's nothing in the middle, pulls everything apart. Um, so, so I guess, I, I think I'm answering your question. And uh, the, the unstable one is, is actually just the repulsion of the nuclei, whereas the uh, stable one is just pulling together the uh, nuclei because there's all these electrons in there. He, he had a follow-up. You have a follow-up? Yeah. The, the, the 1s and 2s. Yeah, I know you had a Yes. So the, 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 the happy face was because they go into these orbitals that pull the, the, okay. The happy face was because we went into these orbitals that pulled everything together. So you're talking about here? Okay. So right, these, these two orbitals, this lower orbital here was this one where we, we came together and they add them and it's one big blob. And this one, they came together and there were two blobs, right? They, they were the two separated ones. And these are unhappy because the, the molecule wants to get pulled apart. Now the 2s up here, it's also a sphere. It does the same thing. So these two orbitals come together and you can add them and you can subtract them and you get the same blob. For down here, you get a blo one blob, an elliptical blob. And up here, you'll get the same kind of shape with two blobs. Um, maybe I have a picture real quickly yeah. here of this. Um, um, we, can, we can probably do this, Yeah, James. we can talk about this afterwards. Afterwards, I you can be probably better. come down and explain It might be better if I could just show you on the slide. Yes. Uh, on the left, yeah, you, yeah. The, the double core hole? Uh, well, so we can do um, theory. We can, we can sit down and we can work out all the Re equations in the quantum question. Oh, the sorry. Question. He wants to know how I'm sure that that, little, that extra little bump in the spectrum, the Auger spectrum, is actually our double core hole. So we have a couple of ways of this. One, uh, we know what all of the single core holes should look like. And so we knew what that spectrum was. So we saw an extra bump. Um, so that's, that's the first indication that something new is happening with the LCLS. How do we know that it's this double core feature? Well, we can do the equations of quantum mechanics. We can work out all of the math. We have a, a theorist who I don't know if he showed up here tonight. I don't <laughs> see him around. But we have somebody who sits there and works out these equations. And he found where, where the energy of this, this feature should be, where this decay energy should end up, and it matches. So we see this bump right at the energy that we would have expected it to be at. So that's, our, that's another verification that we think that this is this, is this double core hole. And uh, we could do further experiments if we, when we, if we get another LCLS uh, run. We could probably do further experiments to verify this. But right now, the fact that it's an added bump from something at the LCLS and the fact that it's at the correct energy uh, makes us think that it's, it's what we're looking for. Uh, let me try on this side now, and I'll come back there now. So um, let me go to the very back. C 
Yes. Mm. Okay, so I, the question was, uh, do these double core holes naturally occur? And the answer is not, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you never get enough um, x-rays together? I mean, so under normal conditions, so I would say on the Earth <laughs> or <laughs> something like the Earth. Maybe somewhere in interstellar space you could have something like an LCLS going on. I don't want to say for, uh, for certain. But on the Earth, you never get enough x-rays together at one time to actually have two um, photons interact in that seven femtoseconds before the, the OJ decay happens, or the OJ Meitner decay. Before that happens, that takes seven femtoseconds, so we need to have two photons interact with our molecule before, <laughs> before that can happen. And actually, no other x-ray source has enough x-rays. No other x-ray source in the world right now has enough x-rays to make, to have two x-ray photons interact with this molecule before the uh, decay can happen. Um, let Does me that answer, that's OK? Yeah. Yeah. OK. Let me take another question here on the right. Yeah. Right, OK. Uh, so, the, so the question was, why does the valence stay in place? Why doesn't the valence get blown away by the x-ray since they're more weakly bound? OK? So the, to answer that, um, there, there's, there's some theory that goes behind this, but I'll try to explain it as best I can. So uh, nature is a lot like car manufacturers. Car manufacturers are very bad at making fast cars, but they can make slow cars very well. By the same token, nature is really good at making slow electrons and really bad at making fast electrons. So it doesn't like to make fast electrons. So if the x-ray photon came in and ionized the uh, electrons from the, the core, or from the valence, the extra energy of the valence would actually be given to the electron as a kinetic energy, and it would make a very fast electron. But nature really doesn't like to make fast electrons. So x-rays mainly interact with the core electrons. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. He does have a more sophisticated answer. You can come down afterwards, and yeah. then he will tell you the details. <laughs> um, let me get someone in the middle here. Yeah? Oh. <laughs> Sorry, you're just one or the other. Let's do both of them, OK? <laughs> so ladies first. <laughs> OK. So all right, I'll try, I'll, the question was, how does getting rid of the core electrons allow you to study the valence environment? OK. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that this doesn't get too difficult. I do have some slides that I could talk to you later about if you want to do that. But so you can think of these cores as being isolated things, right? So they're, they're positive charge surrounded by the negative charge of the electrons. So if you remove a core electron, right? Um, removing a negative charge is similar to adding a positive charge. So what we could think about now is we have these cores that now we remove an, a negative charge from each one, or we add a positive charge to each one. So now these two things are like two positive charges. So if you have two positive charges close together, they're, they're not happy. They want to be further apart. So we see a shift in energy of these core levels. So we'll see a shift in energy of this OJ electron. So if they're further apart, they're happier. So the OJ electron, since it's happier, the OJ electron will have more energy. Since if they're close together and they're unhappy, the OJ electron will have less energy. Um, that, that might be confusing about why, when they're unhappy, the OJ is less energy. I could draw you a picture, and it would probably make more sense if you'd like me to do that later. Let's take a question here. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think there are, there are certain. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Is chlorophyll better at? I'm sorry, I keep forgetting that. Is chlorophyll better at converting light energy into electronic energy than, say, our state-of-the-art photovoltaics? 
Um, and I would say the two processes are very different. Um, I think if we could, I mean, the goal of these organic materials would actually be that they would be easier to produce than these photovoltaic devices that we have now. So the silicon devices are kind of expensive to produce. Um, they also have some, some nasty byproducts um, that are produced. And hopefully, if we were to, to, I mean, this is many levels off, right, many levels of study off. The goal um, of, the, of making these organic uh, things would be that they could be more efficient. They would probably be lower cost to make. And they would probably not have the same byproducts that the, the normal uh, photovoltaic, the, the silicon devices would have. And um, I think, and depending on, I mean, when we study the function of each part, we could find that maybe we can do it more efficiently than, than state-of-the-art silicon can do it. Um, we're going to take two more questions from that side, and then we're going to close. And the questions can continue afterwards, but we need to get closure and get going. So we have here in the front. Yeah, the gentleman in glasses, yes. <laughs> To measure down to, okay, what kind of technologies did we need to measure down to a femtosecond? Okay, well, <laughs> so you can't actually, so there, there's no electronics or anything like that that can measure down to a femtosecond. So usually how you would go about measuring time scales like this in a laboratory setting would be to use light. Um, and you would overlap, uh, based on overlap of light pulses, you can start to measure down to femtoseconds. Because remember uh, the speed of light, so if you look at how far light goes in a, in a femtosecond, it's, it's something that you could start to measure, maybe not with a ruler, but with a very precise measuring instrument. So that's how you, how you usually measure down to, such th to these short times as you use light and you do some sort of interference between light to measure down to these short times. Um, he can probably give you a more detailed explanation afterwards. I think it will be helpful. <laughs> um, the last question at the top over there. Okay, so the question was, besides studying chlorophyll, what other applications does this uh, double core hole uh, technique have? Well, this double core hole technique will let you study any molecule. Any molecule you can think of, if you want to know about the bonding or what's going on, um, it will let you study that. So if, you, if you're interested in a certain reaction or a certain uh, uh, thing that's going on in a molecule, uh, these double core holes should be able to study it. Right? Um, they're very fast, so they're, they're good uh, at t for being your, your flash right, in your stroboscopic imaging because they're very fast to create and they, they don't live very long, so they're a very quick flash. And uh, they're also, since they're sensitive to, to the separations between atoms and the, the bonding between the atoms, the, it's a good tool to study any kind of, uh, of uh, chemical that, that you're interested in. If there's any process that, you are un, that you're not sure about, you could probably start to study it with these double core holes. You'd have to develop a lot more technology probably, but you could probably do it to any molecule. Um, James told me that he'll be available for autographs down here, <laughs> uh, further questions, drawings, everything you want. <laughs> so let's give him a big round of applause for this fantastic talk. <laughs>